All right. Are we live? Is this for real? Well, if we are live, what's going on, guys? Sumner Healy. Um, today, what we're going to be talking about is where to find the best markets to flip land, why market selection matters, our exact market selection process, our frameworks. Um, and we're going to do it live. We're going to try something new here. I think I'm live. I'm not really positive. But we're going to give this a go. Before we dive in and start sharing the nitty gritty, um, one thing that I'm going to put in the chat for y'all. Um, some of you guys might know this, but last month, May, we did something really interesting. We did what we called our Leah Group Coaching Scholarship. Um, we had 106 people apply. Uh, we selected 10 members. So I'll share that in the in the chat. This month in June, we were opening up five slots. We've already had, I don't know, 40 or 50 people apply, um, which is pretty darn wild. So I'll put that in the chat. Um, really what we're looking for is someone who's committed to, <laughs> to land investing, not someone that wants to dip their toe in or just give it a try. Someone who's integral and someone who just needs some assistance, frankly, right? Anyways, um, without further ado, let's get into it and let's talk about the best places to flip land, the million dollar question. Well, maybe a million dollar question. Depends. Um, all right, guys. Uh, for anyone that's in the chat, feel free to drop any questions in there too. If you guys have questions while we're going through this, we'll do a little Q&A. Uh, at the very end. Now, before we talk about this, I need to explain what do most land investors do here, right? Frankly, what do most land investors do wrong when it comes to market selection? For a lot of land investors, market selection is really just an afterthought. Or worse, they piggyback on someone else's work, right? They go to a land watch, they go to someone's website. Well, I respect so-and-so land investor, let me just take his market. Or this looks like there's a lot of people working here, I'll just take their market, right? I know this because that's what I did when I first started. And I've talked to hundreds of land investors who admit the same thing. And the trouble with that is that one, we're not coming up with, with any unique work, which I think from a principal's perspective is unfortunate. Um, but truth be told, if you're playing in the same arenas as most other land investors, you're, you're going to start to get diluted results, right? When I look at kind of the makeup of where most land investors work in, if we had to just hypothetically say, hey, there's 5,000 land investors that are active. Let's just throw that out as a number. There's probably 15 or 20 markets that I can count where the vast majority, 95% of them are participating, right? Think about the model that's taught, right? Go to Costilla County, go to Mojave County. If you go on land watch and look at those markets, you'll see everyone and their mom is there, right? So if we can just start coming up with original ideas, we've already separated ourselves from the pack by a really large margin. Okay, it's so like now we're in uh, a group of you know, 5% of 5,000 people who are working against 250 other land investors by going after unique markets, just stepping outside of the boundaries of what other people are doing. So that's the first thing. It's pretty incredible, the difference there. But that's actually not why we harp on market selection so much. It's not why we spend so much time babbling about it. Frankly, it's because market selection really is a dictator of your results in this business, at least when you're first starting, right? What I always tell people is there's Different devils at different levels, right? When you're six months in, market selection is pretty damn important. When you're five years in and you're starting to build the team and uh, you're, you're trying to go from a million to five million, whatever it may be, market selection is not the thing that's going to get you there typically, right? And at every level, there's, there's kind of a new problem that needs to be tackled. But for most of y'all, for most people on this call, most people that we talk to that are, you know, 30 days in or 36 months in or less, somewhere in that bracket, Usually mastering market selection is, is the easiest lever to pull to drive huge results. And think about it. The difference of the markets we select can radically change our results without adding any more cost to our process, right? And we always talk about hiring you know, acquisition managers and data analysts and all that stuff is relevant and it's great. But frankly, it costs money, right? It costs a lot of money. And so then one of the easiest things you can change to impact your business is just getting better at market selection. Let's think about it. If you wanted to scale a land business what are the two variables that would really move the needle? Well, the first variable would be selling your properties faster, right? If we could say, hey, instead of selling your properties in 90 days, they now sell in 30 days. Well, that's going to make a really big difference in your business, right? The turn time of your properties, the velocity of your capital might be the most important metric in a land business, right? Okay, so if we could tackle that and we could say, hey, you'll also make more on every property you do, right? There'll be a bigger dollar amount there, a bigger spread there. You'd say, well, holy Toledo. Uh, sounds good, Jerry. Sounds good, Jeremy. I appreciate it, man. We'll we'll get it, get it reviewed and send out an email here in a little bit. Um, so let's say, okay, you can sell your properties faster, you can make more, 
And it doesn't cost you any more to do that. It all just comes down to market selection. Sounds pretty crazy. Market selection is like the miracle drug of land investing, right? Because at the end of the day, the markets that we decide to participate in will dictate how quickly we can sell our properties. And it'll the markets that we decide to participate in will also dictate the price points of what properties we're going after, right? I always see people that are like, hey, so I'm trying to scale my business, right? I want to do bigger deals. But you're going after markets where big deals don't even exist, right? To go back to Costilla County, if you're mailing Costilla County, the likelihood of you landing a half a million dollar gross profit deal is as likely as you going to the moon next year. I mean, really, it's like the, the odds are that low, right? And so we got to set ourselves up in the right market where we have exposure to big enough deals. And we've got to be in markets where there's real demand, there's real sell through for the land there, because that's going to really remove a lot of the work in the disposition process. If you've been in this business for any amount of time, or let's just say you've done a few deals, you'll know that dispositions is a real pain in the butt, right? It's because we don't really have any control over dispositions. Really, actually, most of our control on dispositions comes from actually market selection and then how we position and market the property. But outside of that, when we list our properties on the open market, it's just kind of like a cross your fingers, hope it sells soon, hope we get a good offer, all that stuff. We really don't have that much control over it. It's one of the reasons that I really resent dispositions, right? As a, as a land investor, as a CEO, as, as an entrepreneur, you want control, right? You want to be able to control the system that you're operating in. And we really only have control over market selection, acquisitions. And we have a little bit of control over dispositions, right? And so as you start scaling your business, you realize if you're working in the wrong markets, disp dispositions can become a nightmare. You know, back in the day when we first got started, it wouldn't be uncommon to have to talk to 200 to 300 buyer leads before someone said yes. It's a lot of wasted time. Now we get a deal in a, in a market that we're working in put it on the MLS or list it with a realtor and it's gone in a couple of weeks and there's really not much friction there. Okay. So that's why market selection matters. Let's talk about our framework for finding great markets, right? Now, truth be told, there's a lot of different schools of thought out there for finding markets. Um, I'm a little biased to think that ours is potentially the best. <laughs> I'm not sure I haven't seen all of them or done all of them, but there are a lot of different ways to select markets out there. I think when we're looking at market selection, though, really when we're looking at anything in our business, we're trying to balance two sides of the coin, okay? We're trying to balance one side where the thing's effective, whatever the system or the methodology or the framework is that we're using. And we're also trying to balance how much input does it require, right? I know some people that get into like the socioeconomic status of, of sellers. And they look at the zip codes and like median income and they start getting all discombobulated with how they select markets. Frankly, that might be effective, but it takes too much time. Right. So we're trying to balance this of like, okay, it's really effective and it doesn't take that much time to produce. Now, you know, we every year we go through our, our land business and we do a, a, an 80 20 analysis, Pareto principle stuff, if you guys are familiar. And it's so interesting. And everything we do, and frankly, this probably just applies to life, it's like the very small, a very small subset of actions drive the vast majority of our results. Right. We're trying to 80 20 our, our market selection. Okay. So what are the two metrics that we look at for market selection? The first is demand, right? We call that sell-through rate. And what that looks like is, okay, there's 100 properties actively available. That's our supply. And there's, let's say in the last month, 20 properties that sold, okay? It's a 20% sell-through rate. Now we've got different kind of uh, interpretations of, of what those different data points mean in terms of what we like and what we don't like. And that's you know partially at your own discretion, but that's kind of the litmus test for demand. Now there's a little bit more that goes to that, right? There's not, it's not just as like, okay, it had a 20% sell through rate. It's a great market. We've got to look into the characteristics of the properties that are selling. We've got to look at were these on market sales, were they off market sales? That's really going to change kind of the story of what's being played out. And we also have to take in mind supply, right? I always tell people it's like in this business, we're not only trying to buy an asset at a discount. We're also playing a game where we need to get eyeballs, a bit of an internet marketing game. And so we've seen markets where it's like, wow, 25% sell through rate, but there's 700 properties actively available. It's going to be really, really difficult, even though there's a lot of demand, to not get lost in the shuffle. Just like on Google, people typically only look at the first page of results, right? It's category economics. It's the same thing for land listings. So if it's two weeks into listing in that market, we're on the third page of the listings. It's like, well, shit, we might have a well-priced property. It might be in a great market, but no one's going to see it, right? So we're trying to balance that. No, I appreciate you, man. Love you, brother. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're trying to balance that, That like, let's get eyeballs. Let's be in a market that has enough demand. So 
supply is important. It's not just about that sell through rate. It's not just about the demand. Um, and everyone's got their own metrics, right? We've got some folks inside the Leah Group Coaching Program where it's like, I only work in markets that have less than 50 properties actively listed. And that, that's fine. Um, we also have to keep in mind the size of the market, right? Some counties are small. Some counties are really big. Um, and also the makeup of, of the properties that are selling. So um, that's the first part, right? Demand. What's the second part? Homogenous pricing, right? Because if you're a new land investor, which I reckon if you're on this call, you're probably a new land investor, right? If you're a new land investor, don't you dare use neutral letters. <laughs> don't do it. I can't tell you how many times a month we get people reaching out to us, whether it's neutral letters or just poorly put together letters that say Sumner. We had a guy yesterday said Sumner. Well, it's a Justin actually, but Justin related to me. He said, I spent $25,000 on marketing. I've gotten zero deals. We had a gentleman in the program, Andy Barlow, spent, sent out 40,000 neutral letters, zero deals. We had a guy that sent out, spent $100,000 on marketing and got zero deals, right? There's a lot of reasons as to why that might be true, but a commonality that we see for those folks is one, they're using neutral letters, or two, they just have no idea how to put together their pricing, right? And part of that's the byproduct of the markets that you decide to play in, right? Because some markets, frankly, are damn near impossible to price. And again, if we go back to that 80-20 analysis, we also have to think some markets, even if we can price them, just aren't worth the work. You know, if I look at a market where I can price a thousand offers in 30 minutes versus a market where it's going to take me five hours to price another thousand offers, that input to output starts to not really make sense, right? And so what we found is there's more than enough great markets out there. So when you get yourself into a pickle, usually the best advice is just move, to move on. Now, one thing that I have to add as an asterisk here is in my heart of hearts, my belief is neutral letters are actually the best offer strategy. Now, maybe saying somewhere, well, you think it's the best, but you don't want us to use it. Well, there's a lot there's a lot of reasons as to why that is. But if we think about a neutral letter, if we think about the goal of, of, of just mailing in general, what is it? Let's well, get the phone to ring. Let's get people to start reaching out to us, right? The magic really happens once that lead is in our CRM. So if we look at a neutral letter, in theory, it's going to give us the biggest bang for our buck, right? We're going to get the highest response rate, the, the biggest number of leads reaching out to us. The truth is, though, whether it's internal once the lead reaches out to you or it's through the letter, somehow you're going to need to pre-qualify those leads, right? Because not everyone that reaches out is going to be a good fit. Now, if you're a solo operator, you're a brand spanking new land investor, the likelihood of you wanting to go through 300 leads and pre-qualify them and the likelihood that you have the skill to do that is essentially nil or zero. What's more likely is that you send out offers that have a price and that's your pre-qualification filter. And then you get people reaching out to you. And so now you're the solo operator. And instead of having 400 leads reach out to you, you have 30 or 40, but they're really like, high quality. They're, they're, they've been pre-qualified. Now, not every single lead is going to be perfect, right? You're going to get some crazy people that still reach out, but the vast majority of them are. And so that means that you're going to be putting your time in the right place. The other thing is, again, you just probably don't have the acquisition skill set to go manage a bunch of seller leads reaching out to you or the due diligence skill set, right? The problem with neutral letters is it makes it too goddamn easy on the front end to send mail. And then people send out mail willy nilly without doing any research. They get all these leads calling to them. And they're like going hour by hour to comp a lead because they've never researched that market before. Once you're starting to intimately understand these markets to price them on the front end, when a lead comes back to you in 30 seconds, you know, this is a deal. This isn't a deal. Like, you know, really, really quickly, right? So when you're first starting, kind of like the, the workflow that I take people through is start with blind offers. Even if you've got a lot of money, you've got experience, even if you can afford a teammate, start with blind offers, right? Then you can graduate to range offers. And frankly, you could use a little bit of range offers when you're first starting. It's kind of like a tool in your tool belt. There's some markets where it's like, I just can't come up with a blind offer here. So a range offer makes sense. But I wouldn't lean on it too heavy because again, it's kind of like that hybrid of a neutral letter and a blind offer. And you're going to kind of bombard yourself with too many leads. And then as you start building an infrastructure, right, really just a team, you can start to handle neutral letters. We've got two acquisition managers on our team, and I can't even handle sending out a lot of neutral letters, right? And we sent out in um, uh, March, we sent out 18,000 neutral letters as a test for bigger properties for subdivide candidates, and we fell flat on our face. We got zero deals, zero leads. Well, not zero leads, but zero deals. And we just couldn't handle all the stuff. It's like a tsunami wave of leads coming to us. We just frankly couldn't handle it, couldn't work through it. And we got zero. And I think we went and sent 18,000 blind offers for those kinds of properties. We probably could have gotten that deal or two, or whether it's range offers. I mean, same, same. Um, so how do we find homogenous pricing? Well, I always tell land investors, zoom in, zoom in, right? That's how you start. Most people look at markets as a county, 
And that's just like some terrible advice that's been preached by the talking heads in the land space. Like everyone assumes a market is a county. And sure, I mean, that makes sense when you're first starting to kind of, they're interchangeable to some respect, but we don't mail counties or we very rarely mail counties, right? Because the likelihood that a whole county can be priced intelligently is, is almost zero. There's some out there, but there's very few and far between. So the three styles of, of uh, kind of breaking down counties that we use, we always talk about subdivisions a lot. So subdivisions typically have uniform pricing. We talk about using polygons. So you can use polygons inside a data tree to kind of break up the county. So, hey, maybe like the northern end has like clean homogenous pricing. The south is just crazy. And usually pricing gets crazy because of topographical features. So it's like there's a lake, there's a mountain, there's a city. That's going to really swing pricing, typically, if we had to generalize, right? So you might have to break up the county into chunks. It could be multiple chunks. could just be one chunk. Or you can use actually acreage as a filter, right? So you might say, all right, in this county, one to a thousand acres are impossible to intelligently price. But two to three acres, I can price. And three to four acres, I can price. And you can start breaking that county down by acreage. The truth is, in a lot of cases, we use all those stacked together, right? And again, there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. What we're optimizing for is works good enough and doesn't take too much time, right? I think this is a really a, an interesting kind of mindset shift for a lot of people is that if you look at, if you've ever built out a, a mailer, you've probably said, wow, this took way longer than I expected. This was way harder to do than I expected. And usually if I had to give a quick snap judgment as to why that is, it's because people spend very little time picking markets. They pick a market that's pretty close to impossible to price. And then they spend eons trying to price it. And there's like scratching their head. How the heck do I do this? Where I, I always tell people, flip that around. Spend more time on the market selection, looking at demand and homogenous pricing. And once you find something that fits both of those, the pricing process should be really quick, right? When we go and build out mailers, and we've got videos on the channel that you guys can watch of me doing it live. I usually spend about an hour going through the pricing. And I'll do like just a first initial pass. So go really quick. Give myself 24 hours, so a little bit of reprieve, a break, come back with fresh eyes, give it one more review, send it out. I mean, most of our mailers take no more than an hour to two hours to put together from start to finish. I think it's really important, too, that we don't over-nurture, over-baby, over-analyze our mailers. What I found is usually two pass passes, and then from there, it just starts to get worse. Like, you're just your decision-making just gets worse. So I would rather just, hey, good is good enough, and just get it sent out from there. Um, anyone have any questions on what we've gone through so far? All right, cool. We'll keep on going. Um, the next point is that all markets are relative. I mean, really, all things in life are relative, right? How the heck do you know what a good market is? Well, only if we have another market to compare it to. And so what I see a lot of land investors getting wrong is that they go after the first market, second market, third market they see. It takes a really big sample size to know if you've got something good. I wish I could share my screen here. I actually don't know how to do this. I'm relatively new to this whole going live. But if you guys could see my screen, I've got a, an Excel sheet pulled up. And it's broken down by dozens of states. And in every state, we've got counties broken down in there. And every month, we have a data analyst go through and update all those numbers. And they break down the numbers for acreage range, too. And they say, OK, cool. And you know, Tyler County, Texas, for example, one to two acres last month had a 30% sell-through rate. Two to threes had a 12% sell-through rate. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of our, our picking markets, but also we have that relative to comparison. So we can come in every month and say, bada bing, bada boom, this is the clear winner. Let's go there, right? It takes a lot of the work off of our plate. Really, at that point, we've solved for the demand part of things. And then we're just going and trying to find pockets that we can intelligently price. Um, one thing that's pretty interesting, we've talked about this inside the group. I don't know if, if this is the first time you've heard about it on here. So we've been trying to crack the code of how do we do this at scale for others, right? How do we provide this as like a service where you could essentially fractionalize the cost of a data analyst? The trouble is right now, we only track probably 100 and 150 markets, and it takes a ton of manpower for our one data analyst to do this, right? This data set becomes more valuable the more counties you're tracking. And so we wanted to go after and quantify the entire U.S. to find the best markets, but we found it simply impossible to do it with uh, like manpower, right? People just going and manually entering it. it becomes very, very close to impossible. So we were like, hey, I wonder if we can write a script, right? A script that goes and scrapes all that data online 
and then we can interpret it and put it into a spreadsheet. So we tried on Zillow, we slapped us on their wrist. We tried on Landwatch, slapped us on their wrist. Like a lot of these platforms don't want you getting or scraping their data. And we actually found a backdoor into Redfin uh, last month uh, on, on how to go and aggregate all that information. So we selected a thousand counties that roughly met our metrics that we wanted to track on an ongoing basis. Um, and then we started running into computer issues. Like these computers were literally starting to like spit and sputter. There's just too much data, too many data points coming in because for every market, we're tracking 49 different data points. And so that factored in with all the counties taking like 180 hours just to get through a few of them um, just because the computers couldn't keep up with it. So we started hitting our heads against the table. We're like, God, is this possible? Well, sure enough, we get a call from a guy uh, at the University of North Carolina who's been uh, building a Redfin script as part of, I don't know, his college thesis or something like that. Not for land, it was for houses. And so we actually came in and bought this piece of code from him and brought him on to manage it on a monthly basis. Uh, and in July, we're releasing our kind of data analytics newsletter, if you will, right? Where we're going through and aggregating all the data on a thousand plus counties every month and then interpreting where the sell through rate is, where the action is, and then break that down by size range. We're actually trying to take this same concept and apply it to zip codes. So an even bigger project, as you can imagine, the data set gets ginormous, but I think that's where the real value in this business is. I mean, if you can start cracking down on sell through rates in terms of zip codes, game over essentially. So really exciting, uh, something we're working on. But yeah, what I was saying is all markets are relative, right? So for us, it started with just tracking this in a sheet, uh, we used to do it manually. Then we hired a VA to do it. We've got tons of folks inside the community that pay people 100, 200 bucks a month to go and track this information. And so you need these comparisons. And so usually what I tell people is like, go and identify, you know, 100, 200 markets that you, you like in the here and now, and then start tracking them on an ongoing basis. And ideally pay someone to do that. And they just go and get the data from whatever data source you want to use. And they go in and populate it. And that's a really, really great way to remove a lot of the headache for market selection. You see what typically happens is it's the end of the month or the end of the week. And you say, oh, shoot, I haven't hit my mail goal. I got to get some mail out. And then you start scrambling to find a market and you just rush, rush through that work. Um, and it kind of in the name of getting your mail goal or hitting your mail goal. And, and really here in the, at this part in the business, quality matters, right? When it comes to selecting markets, quality is, is very important. And same thing with your pricing. And then from there, it's like everything outside of that in this business is really just a quantity game. How many leads can we get? How many leads can we talk to? How many conversations can we have? What's our talk time? It becomes more, more about quantity, but on the front end, it's really about quality. Do you guys have any questions on what we've gone through here? Anything I can assist with inside your business, inside uh, figuring out your market selection process? If you guys do have any questions, feel free to put them inside the chat. I'm always looking for things where they just have like asymmetric returns, where it's like the a little bit of additional work has outsized returns, right? And, and market selection is certainly one of those things. I would really encourage you to spend time mastering it um, in whatever fashion that might look like, whether it's just getting reps in or uh, going through a apprenticeship or coaching or a course or whatever, really honing in on that's gonna have like the most immediate return uh, when you're first getting started. Um, if you guys don't have any more questions for me, we could end it here. But if you guys do, I can be happy to go through and answer those with you. If you guys like these lifestyle videos, um, let me know. And one thing to note too, I'll put this inside the chat for you guys. Uh, this Friday, we're doing a happy hour and land investing Q and a it's virtual. Um, uh, we've got, we're opening up 50 seats, totally free, totally awesome. If you guys want to come join, uh, you can just put your information on that little Google form I put in there and we'll get you added to the calendar invite. Uh, we've got about, I'm just looking at it right now. We've got about 20 seats left. So we, we released it yesterday. We've already had 30 people sign up. So we've got about 20 spots. Um, but we'd love to see you guys there. It's going to be really, really fun. Well, you guys got everything figured out? No questions? Come on. It's got to be something. Uh, uh, how's everyone's land business doing? Are you guys feeling the, the market is improving? Do you think the market's getting worse? Have you got more deals, less deals? Can someone talk to me about what's going on in their business? Are you guys too shy? Uh, who do you use to send mail? Yeah, that's a good question, Jeremy. Um, so I've, I've tried like every freaking mail house out there. Um, I've sent all different kinds of mail, postcards, one page letters, two page letters, 
oversized envelopes. I've really tried it all. And what I've settled on is that simple really wins here, right? So uh, we use just a two-page letter, and that doesn't matter if we're doing a range offer, blind offer, neutral letter. We use a two-pager, um, and we use Rocket Print and Mail. Rocket Print and Mail, the cheapest or the fastest. They have kind of a different model than a lot of other places. I'll put it in the chat if you guys want to get access to the, the discounts that we have with them. Um, but what's really cool is that when they work with land investors, they know our business well. So we kind of have like a little land investing team assembled over there that you guys can work with. Um, but they also, the way their model works is you pre-buy, uh, you kind of put a down payment on whatever package you want and you can discount the prices substantially. So a lot of mail houses, they might have like a, a lower minimum or no minimum, but you're going to pay like 60 to 65 cents for a two page letter. Um, and we pay 50 cents to 52 cents, depending on what plan you are. So that really starts to add up towards the end of the year when you're you know, scaling up your marketing. Um, it's it's really worthwhile to make sure you're locking in the, the best rate there. And I recommend two page letter, standard postage, first class postage doesn't really seem to matter. Um, Kay says, just getting started, how many mailers do you recommend to send your first month? I mean, frankly, I'd be lying if I said I, I had the answer. It's a kind of an impossible question to answer. Um, I would say, Typically more than you probably expect. I mean, if you think about it like this, right? We track, track the results for our community and most folks are getting a deal between 1,700 and 2,000 letters for one deal. Our average deal is somewhere in like the range of a buy for 15, 20,000, all the way up to buy for like a, you know, maybe 200,000, kind of somewhere in that wheelhouse. Um, so like we call them mid-ticket properties. So it usually takes us like 1,700 to 2,000 letters to get a deal. Most folks inside of our program are making either $5 to $7.60 for every single letter they send, which is kind of like an interesting um, an interesting dynamic, right? To think about when we spend 50 cents or 52 cents on a letter, what do we get on the back end? That's a cool metric to track. So, okay, I mean, yeah, it takes more letters than most people expect. You could definitely send too much and overwhelm yourself and not be able to accurately handle the leads. So if I had to generalize, I mean, typically, 3,000, 5,000 a month is a pretty good starting point. Um, but it really depends on how much time you can put forth in the business, right? Because once those leads start coming in, if you're missing a beat there and you're not getting back to them fast enough or you're not handling them, handling them correctly, you're literally lighting money on a fire. I mean, you might spend $100 to $200 for every lead that comes in down. So if you can't accurately manage those, you can just waste money in that process, right? So it really depends on how much how much time you can put forth in the business. But yeah, usually three to five thousand is a pretty safe bet, and then from there start scaling up. And you know, six months in, sending ten thousand a month should be pretty damn reasonable. Uh, the the thing that's really important though, don't send any mail unless you know what you're doing. Right? Like as we talked about in the beginning with the folks that we've talked to that have lost six figures or fifty thousand or twenty five thousand on mail and not gotten any deals. That's a real risk. And I, I don't say this because I'm biased. I say this because this game is simple, but it's not easy, right? I think Noah can attest to that. It's a simple game. It's not an easy game. And so you'd be better off ensuring that you've got a really sound footing, uh, the correct playbook for picking markets and mailing before you start sending out 3,000, 5,000 mailers. I mean, you'll, you, ultimately, you'll probably just waste money. There's two ways you can learn, right? Either the market can be your teacher or someone else, an apprentice, you could do an apprenticeship, you could go coaching, you could go a course, make a friend of the community and learn that way, right? That's usually going to be a little bit safer. There's less risk there, but also you're, you're usually your efforts are going to compound, right? So we typically see folks inside the Leah Group Coaching Program, we get a deal in about 90 to 100 days, 120 days, where for me, I mean, it took me seven months to get my first deal and I didn't go with any kind of education. That's pretty typical. Usually like six months to 12 months to get your first deal, if you're trying to go willy nilly, there's outliers, there's freaks who just pick up this business. But for the most part, it's pretty accurate. Uh, Jeremy says it take a while to start getting responses, though. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a latency to uh, to what we do, especially with direct mail. So, you know, usually you send out your data set to the mail house. It'll take them a week to prep it. They'll mail it out. Take two to three weeks to touch down. Takes two weeks for that mail to season. Um, and then you know, leads start trickling in from there. Um, so yeah, it takes time, but that's why we're such big believers in having a clean mailing cadence. So once you start scaling up and you're building a pipeline, there won't be any blip in your lead flow, right? If you stick to a clean mailing cadence, you always have leads come in. So you really only feel that latency when you're first getting started. And then from there, it's just, they just steadily drip in, right? Um, that's one thing I'd encourage is always break down your mailers to a steady stream. So you don't just have a tidal wave of leads coming in by dropping too much mail at once. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I do think it's best to put an expiration date on your letter. I don't think there's any good counterpoint as to why you shouldn't. I mean, it builds urgency, um, which you want to get the seller to move. You don't want them just to be noodling on it from the sideline. Uh, so you want them to, to take action. So an expiration date is wise. You know, usually 60 days out, 90 days out, somewhere somewhere like that's a pretty safe bet. So uh, we include anytime a letter has a price listed on it, we include uh, an expiration date. I'd, I'd recommend everyone do so. I don't think there's any good counterpoint as to why you shouldn't. And we get people all the time that call after it if the letter's expired. I mean, we'll still do the deal, obviously. It's not a big deal. You just have to send them a new contract. But it definitely puts a little bit of fire under the seller's ass to, to reach out to you. Because in this case, I mean, inactivity, inaction on the seller's part is a really common problem, right? And we're trying to expedite that process. Um, Victor, what's your experience with the Northeast? Seems like many people up there are very reluctant to sell. Uh, Northeast. Um, I, mean, I think people all over as a generalization are reluctant to sell. Now, think about it like this, Victor. If we send out uh, 10,000 letters, we typically get 50 to 60 leads from 10,000 letters. So do the math. I mean, the vast majority of people are reluctant to sell or just don't want to sell. Um, so it's kind of like, I think a commonality, uh, across the board, that's why we get such low response rates and low acceptance rates, but the business is still wildly profitable despite that. Now in the Northeast, I do think there's a little more at play there. It's older land. So that land has been, has been owned for generations. So like, you know, we've seen properties in Virginia where it's been owned for 150 years. You don't really see that in the, the Southwest. And so I think there's a little more pride of ownership. There's a little more connection to the land that's, that's been in the family for generations. Uh, historically, it's, it's more expensive land in most cases. And so anytime you're going up on the price ladder, you've got to understand that the seller's socioeconomic position is probably different. They're probably more affluent. They've got more options. They're typically more educated about the value of their land. And so you're typically not going to get the fire sellers, the people that just don't care and just want to sell immediately. Um, but what I can tell you wholeheartedly is that myself and you know, 100 plus others inside the program do deals in the Northeast. And there's, there's a lot to be had there. Um, so I don't know how big your sample size was where you you, you got the, the vibe that they're uh, less likely to sell. I think, though, yeah, I mean, there's definitely markets where people are a little more uh, grumpy. And this might just be like a Northeast personality type, too. You know, people always talk about people in New England being grouchy and grumpy because of the weather. I think that's really real. And so that could be part of it as well. What I will say, though, is you can get deals in any market. So have no fear. Like mail mail anywhere, mail everywhere, as, well, as long as the math is telling you that, yes, people want land here. No, there's not too much supply. And there's quality ownership data. If we can check off those three boxes, I'll mail there. I don't care if the people are grumpy, if the people are happy. Some of our best deals come from what we call red sellers, right? These are sellers that are rah, real gruff on the phone. They want to rush through the conversation. But there's a way to talk to those people. There's a way to dance that dance and still get deals from them. Uh, do you have a sample offer letter you use uh, that I – what do you mean by a sample offer letter that I use? you mean one for you guys? Uh, we've got sample offer letters inside the program. We actually just built out uh, a partnership with Pebbles. We made like a Leah Pebble variant. So it's got all of our systems built in, all of our offer uh, templates uh, neighbor letters, purchase agreements. And it's got all of our stages for sellers, buyers, and inventory, and like the preset checklist that you have to go through to move either one of those or any one of those to the next stage. So all of our communication templates and all that jazz. So we don't have anyone that we just put out on the internet, um, but it's either inside the program or inside Pebble. What I will say is like a sample offer letter uh, for the purchase agreement doesn't really make much difference. When it, I wish I could share my screen so I could show, show you guys a, a kind of a nifty little template. Um, really like the, the actual purchase agreement, just make sure it's a one pager, make sure the terms are favorable. You know, you can close in 30 days, you can cancel the contract at any point, you can assign the contract if you want to. The purchase agreement, really simple. I think the only area that you might want to experiment with is that first page. And so I'm, I'm gonna pull up a template, I'll read it to you guys. It's annoying that I can't share it. But let me pull up and share with you guys kind of a, a workflow that I recommend everyone use for, for offer letters. Now, I might be saying, something that's so mean of you. Why, why are you not going to put your offer letter online? Well, frankly, because it diminishes the value for everyone, right? If I put up an offer letter and everyone on the YouTube channel or wherever starts using it, well, that just gets worse and worse for all of us, right? So usually what I encourage people to do is use a framework and then build off of that. 
Now, giving it out inside the program or inside Pebble, we're dealing with a much smaller sample size. And so it's, it's, I'm a little more okay with that. But even then, I tell, still tell people, make it your own, right? Um, because it doesn't do us any good to all be using the same thing. Now, for a purchase agreement, that's totally fine. Um, but for anything else in terms of that front page, I recommend making some edits. So let me get this pulled up here and I'll read it off to you guys. I don't know why this is being uh, a little bit tricky. So let me, I'm just going to log into our program and I'll actually pull it up in there. I wish I could share my screen on here. Frankly, I just don't really know how to do it. <laughs> Not very good at this technology stuff. And that's a testament to the fact that you don't need to be good at Excel, don't need to be good at technology to run a land business. That was one of the things that I thought when I was first getting started is like, oh, man, I'm terrible at technology. Like, will I be able to pull this off? I never felt, I didn't even really know how to use Excel before starting this business. Uh, none of that stuff is too relevant. So that's that's the good news. Okay, let me get this pulled up for y'all. Bum, 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 bum. Go into the curriculum. Uh, attachments, templates. Okay, so we call this our blind offer framework template. And I'm going to download this and I'll read it to you guys. Uh, okay, so typically this is how we start our letter. This is on the first page. So you're always going to have like at the top header, you know, your company name, address, contact information. You'll have whatever date it was mailed out at. You'll have the seller's name, their address, their mailing information, and then, a, you know, a hi, hello, whatever it may be, then their name. Then space down, I'm interested in your property located in county and state. And then you want to go explain who you are and why you want to buy the property. The benefits of selling with you opposed to using an agent or whatever it else it may be. So that might be, hey, avoid costly close, closing, <laughs> costly closing costs, uh, close in 30 days, have a surefire offer that you don't have to negotiate or go back and forth on. Uh, and then instructions on how they can get in touch with you and how to return the purchase agreement, include a deadline. So to, to the point mentioned earlier, reiterate your contact information, sign off the letter, boom, second page purchase agreement. Now you can get more saucy than that, but frankly, if you look at every good offer letter I've ever written or anyone else has ever written that I've seen, it just all they all just use that same exact format. So, you know, just kind of fill it in with your own flavor. I think it's important that A, we don't all use the same offer letter that would not help anyone. Um, and B, it's important that you speak in your voice, right? So if you speak in Sumner's voice and then they call you and you're like, hi, this is Billy. It's going to sound weird. You want like, with any kind of marketing, it needs to have continuity from start to finish, right? So imagine you're on a, you're on Facebook and you see a Facebook ad and it's like pink balloons, girly, it's cool. And then you click on the page and it's like hardcore man stuff. That would be weird. There's, there's not much, there's like, you start to not trust that marketing. Well, that same thing applies to the, the voice or the tone that your letter's written in and how you or your team interfaces with the seller. You want continuity from start to finish. Uh, Victor says, what does your typical workday consist of when exploring sending new counties? I work for about 12 hours a day since I'm really in the zone until the mailer is complete. Yeah, so Victor, um, we talked about this earlier. I would really encourage you to not blow through your mailer all in one chunk. So. I don't really build out mailers anymore, but um, when I, if I do or when I do, if I'm making one of these videos, typically what it looks like is um, pull the market, go through our list, get the market from there, go figure out spot check, can I figure out the pricing? If I can, we'll pull the data, go through the first pass on pricing. That's usually 30 minutes to an hour. Pause, reset. You can either come back later in the day, but I typically like leaving one day. We'll come back the next day, look at it with fresh eyes, go through it one more time, send it out. And I think what you might be doing is your market selection and your mailing. So inside of Leah, we talk about something called market Mondays. You want to segment those two processes because they're very different. So on Mondays, everyone goes through and starts aggregating and finding their markets. And then later in the week, you use those markets that you found to pull the data and price them. I wouldn't do them all at once. One, you'll start to fatigue, but it's also just a different skill set, right? So it's kind of using different parts of your brain. So I recommend separating those. Um, now, if we talk about what does a typical workday look like for me currently, well, frankly, right now I spend a crap ton of time working on Leah, whether it's via coaching or working on the back end, uh, because frankly, I think that we're on a quest of building the most powerful land investing community with, with the students with the best results. And I'm really passionate about that idea. You know, what will happen to you in this land investing business? And it's a good problem to have, I suppose, but you will start making money. You'll be a few years in and you'll realize this business does not do anything for your fulfillment, right? 
that's the place I found myself in a year, year and a half ago. Okay, I achieved my dream, but why do I feel so empty? Well, because I'm just flipping land. I'm just arbitraging an asset. And so for me, I get so much energy from, from the coaching side of things that I'm able to redirect that back to my land business. Because frankly, I was kind of at the point where I'm like, I just don't want anything to do with the day-to-day. -day. Now, if we look at what do I do in the land business? Well, I'm, I'm looking forward. So I'm always looking at what, what do the next six to 12 months look like? So sometimes it's implementing new strategies, right? Like eight months ago, I said, okay, we need a way to deploy more capital in our land business without doing more deals. How do we do that? Well, I can't go buy a million dollar property and flip it for two million. It just doesn't really exist. The only way we could do that is by adding value, entitlements, subdivisions, things like that. So eight months ago, I said, this is the direction that we're going to go. And that's where we began putting our energy and attention. So we're always kind of I'm always looking forward at, at what we're going to be doing and just thinking about it and mapping it out. So I spent a lot of time doing that or some time doing that. Uh, I review deals, so deals on the, mainly on the acquisition side. So I go through and say, my team says, hey, we got this contract, this contract, this contract. I go through review, review, say, no, 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 yes, 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 here's why. Spend time coaching and training the team, uh, looking for new hires, trying to find more money to do deals. That's about it, right? Uh, if you've built your land business effectively, frankly, you shouldn't be the one doing the thing. You should be the one going and trying to find more money, so making relationships, shaking hands and kissing babies. <laughs> You should be reviewing deals, saying yes, no, um, and you know, hiring and training and all that stuff. But eventually, that can even be taken off your plate, right? Uh, you really don't want to be the one doing the thing, calling the seller, finding the market, pulling the data, all that stuff. You want to as much as possible be working towards getting off that off your plate. Now, that doesn't happen immediately, but that's the north star I think everyone should be working to because this business is very systematic, right? And so it's doesn't, not that difficult to kind of, I always tell people you're creating a conveyor belt. So think about all the different processes, step by step by step by step, and create roles for each one of those steps. Victor says, sorry, by exploring, I meant to say that I spend most of the time APN pricing and figuring out why land sells for a certain amount. I've already chosen a county. What, uh, Victor, what do you mean by APN pricing? You mean going in and reviewing each APN like line by line, or I'm curious what the, what you mean by APN pricing? Um, meant to say that I spent most time about figuring out why land sells for a certain amount. Yeah, I mean, dude, I don't think you need to figure out why the land sells for a certain amount. All you need to know is that the land does sell for a certain amount, right? So it's less about knowing the why; it's just knowing that it does, and then figuring out as you as a land investor. What do you want to offer on that, right? That's always a, a decision that comes down to the land investor. Do you want to offer 60%, 55%, 40%, 45%? And then you get to make that judgment call. And that's not like a thesis that remains true for your whole business. That's just something that is more broken down on each mailer. Frankly, uh, Victor says, oh. Um, yeah, frankly, this stuff, like, I think people are always like, someone, what is your business's offer percentage? I'm like, dude, I don't know. Like, it's different on every mailer. It's a different time and a place. And I think where a lot of people get tripped up is that you iterate on your mailer. So we'll send out a mailer at 50%. Oh, shit, that didn't really work. We'll do 55%. Maybe we got to go lower. So you're always iterating on this stuff. Like, it's like not like you ever really know for certain. But again, you don't need to know why. You just need to know the land is selling at hypothetically $40,000 an acre. And so then you get to come up with what you want to price that stuff at. Anyone else have any questions? Do, do, do. I appreciate all the questions, Victor, Kay, Jeremy. Thank you guys for contributing and chiming in. Uh, Victor says, I agree on doing a thousand hour work versus $25 an hour work. I'm writing out designing my systems for that currently. Yeah, I think a really good exercise for everyone here, no matter where you're at, step one, step a thousand document what you do, right? Record what you do. So record your screen. You use Google Meet, record your screen, document it, write down the SOPs. We use lucid charts. And even if you don't have a team, or even if you're not close to hiring a team, that will pay dividends in the long run. You really want to think like an investor or not. You really want to think like an entrepreneur. Geez. I always tell people they get into this business thinking they're going to be a land investor. And then they realize what they need to become is a land entrepreneur, right? You want to be looking at this through the lens of a business owner. Let me show you guys something that I think is valuable for everyone here. Um, so first off, this book, Traction. I recommend everyone pick up a copy of this book. 
This is an amazing book for understanding how to build a team, how to build a culture. And then the next one is uh, I can't find I can't find the other one, but it's, it's the E Myth. The E Myth is a great book as well for understanding. Uh, creating leverage, building teams, building processes, systems. But I'd say track, Traction by Gino Wickman is probably uh, my favorite on that note. And frankly, I'm probably due to read it again because you need to really drill this stuff in. All right, guys. Anyone else have any questions? I've got a, a call coming up here uh, in an hour that I have to prep for. Uh, attention all LEA members, too. Anyone that's on this call, remember our call is at 12.30 p.m. PST today. Coach Ryland will be leading that as well. Uh, for everyone here that's on the chat, I know we've been sharing a bunch of links inside the chat. Uh, we'll put this in here one more time. If you guys would like to see if you're a fit for our scholarship, you guys can use the link down there, landinvestor.co slash scholarship. So it gives you a scholarship into our LEA group coaching program, which is a 12-month coaching program. It's currently a five-figure program. Frankly, we, we spend a lot of time working one-to-one -one and over-delivering. There's a lot of cost in terms of the people required. So I'd be lying if I said it was a cheap program. But at the end of the day, you're paying for outcomes, not information, right? I think the outcomes are really what's important. The trouble is when I first started my land business, I had no money. I had $7,000. I couldn't have afforded any kind of coaching, right? And I really think that like the difference between coaching and a course is a pretty big deal in this business. The courses are in a vacuum. It's very static. Everything looks so easy. You go through a course, you say, I can do this. And then you start doing it yourself and you're like, I can't do this. Why does this look so much easier in the course than it actually is in real life? And that's where coaching is really important, right? When we look at learning something, it all comes down to feedback loops, right? So can we tighten that feedback loop? So the feedback loop could be like we talked about earlier with Jeremy, you send out a mailer, you wait three months, four months, and then you find out from the market if you did a good job or not a good job. But instead I say a better process is, you pick a market, a coach reviews that market. You put your mailer together, they review your pricing. You send it out, they review every lead. They say, do this one, do this one, say, no to this lead, here's what you should do. And then your sales trainer goes through and shows you how to negotiate those deals. Like having someone with you every step of the way, that creates a much tighter feedback loop that allows you to compound your results way faster. The problem is oh, there's a lot of folks out there that have the tenacity, that have the want, that have the desire to build a business in the land arena. They don't have the means for support there. And that was me, right? Four years ago, I, I needed help and I couldn't get help. And that was a byproduct of not having the money, but also not seeing something out there that resonated with me, right? There was a lot of stuff on the information around land investing, which cool, that's a skill. I wanted information around building a land business because frankly, that's way more exciting, right? You guys can tell me in the chat, but what are you optimizing for? Is it just money or is it freedom? I think for most of us here, it's freedom. The trouble is you can make a lot of money and not have freedom. I've been there. You can also make a lot of money and have freedom. And that's by creating leverage and building a team and creating systems. I think at the end of the day, that's really what we're trying to solve, right? So when someone comes into the Lead Group Coaching Program for six months or let's master that skill of land investing, right? You can make a couple hundred grand with that skill set, but you're going to cap out. There's a glass ceiling. The rest of those six months is let's take that skill. Let's create leverage around it. We look at bringing in people. We look at eliminating stuff that's not serving us. We look at some automation, right? And that's going to create leverage in that system. And that's going to allow you to not only scale, it's going to allow you to scale without more input from you. The best feeling when building a business is when you're, the output that you get is detached from your input. So whether you do something that day, whether you work that day, deals still come in. Purchase agreements still go out. Deals still sell. That's the best feeling. That's what we're optimizing for here. So anyways, I digress. I put that down there in the chat if you guys want to apply. Once you guys apply, well, the team and I will go through and review your application. Uh, if everything looks good, we'll send out an email giving you an invite to schedule a call. Uh, we'll go through that call, kind of get a sense on where you're at, where you're looking to go. Uh, and then after that, the team and I will meet and uh, let you know from there. We'll give a make a decision from there. So anyways, guys, thank you for joining me. I just ran way longer than expected. I hope that was valuable and I'll see you guys soon. Everyone take care of yourself. Have a great week.